Father, we acknowledge the tremendous significance of what we're looking at, that there is a symbiotic bond with Jesus Christ that begins at new birth. And that bond begins to gestate and take form within the ground of the old humanity, separate but in the framework of the old. As the old decreases, it makes way for the new to come forth, which is eternal in nature. We ask you to grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation into the morphe of God. And we know, Lord Jesus, that you have ever been and subsisted in the morphe of God, the essential form and manifestation of that form, and that we are in the process of being conformed to assume and take on your indwelling morphe as the divine seed. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at metamorphosis and transformation, a process that begins at new birth, and then it progresses from new birth, at least it's supposed to progress, in terms of sanctification, which we are to pursue. So sanctification means progressive consecration, being set apart to the Lord, to allow the outer shell, the outer man, to die, the circumcision to continue, so that the divine seed and that divine life and that divine form can continue to increase and take form in us. We only take with us into eternity the measure in which Christ has been formed in us in this life. There's nothing more, nothing less. And so you take different people at the end of their life, the formation of Christ has different measures and different densities, if you will, different features depending on that person's consecration, spiritual development, and singularity of focus of understanding what Paul meant when he spoke about pressing for the prize in Philippians 3, 7-17, gaining Christ, being perfected, attaining the out-resurrection from the dead, those kinds of things. It's all there in that language. So we're going to be looking at the first phase of metamorphosis, and that is the implantation of the divine seed at new birth. We'll note the very familiar passage that we've read so many times in the Gospel of John. We won't read the entire section, but we know that Nicodemus came to the Lord by night. He didn't want to be identified. He is the teacher in Israel. That means he had a premier teaching seat in the Sanhedrin there in Israel. He was very renowned, but he came to Jesus by night. We'll see him in heaven, by the way. So he comes to Jesus. He's interested in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, John 3, 3, I say to you, unless one is born again, adverb, anothen, cannot see the kingdom of God. That anothen means a spiritual birth. You've had a natural birth. There must be a birth from above. It must have a heavenly source, a spiritual source, if you're going to see the kingdom of God. And, of course, all Nicodemus could respond to is the natural. He couldn't think beyond his own natural capacities. So what happens when there is a birth from above? A scripture describes that in various ways. Titus chapter 3. We'll just notice how the scripture interprets itself. Best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Good hermeneutics is make sure that you, when you're interpreting scripture, you don't need some extraneous, bizarre teaching to understand scripture. Scripture, compared with scripture, will bring forth its own interpretation. In Titus chapter 3, Verse 4, in contrast to our previous life in sin and lost condition, especially verse 3, but verse 4 of Titus 3, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind, this is philoanthropos, this means God has an affection for mankind. This is not an agape. This is an affection, a demonstrated affection for mankind, appeared, was manifested. God our Savior, referring to Jesus Christ, He's referred to in 2.13, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. When he appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration. Polygonasia, that is, a birth that brings about a new beginning. There's a natural birth, and then there's a new birth, a regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit. At the regeneration, the Holy Spirit comes in, and the Holy Spirit is the custodian and the indwelling source that unites us with Christ and that takes the things of Christ and reveals them to us, not just information, but takes the spiritual DNA of Christ 
and brings it in at new birth. So now that spiritual DNA needs to expand and grow and take form. Okay? And whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus our Lord. So notice, regeneration, the newing of the Holy Spirit, was poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Lord. When did that happen? Not some subsequent event of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, but it's tied in with that being justified by his grace, you might be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So justification and regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit happens simultaneously. That's also found in Ephesians 1. So there's no subsequent baptism. There can be a filling and a filling that can be subsequent to salvation, but no baptism. You see that? Washing of regeneration. So that means something is initiated by God that's intimately interdependent with the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. And then 1 Peter chapter 1, we're just laying a foundation so that we can see, okay, here's what happens at new birth, but once we have this divine life, this divine seed in us, then there are specific, biblically defined parameters that we're responsible for to cooperate with the indwelling Holy Spirit so this divine seed can continue to form the Christ life and the Christ nature in us. And so in 1 Peter 1, verse 22 and 23, Now since you, in obedience to the truth, that is the gospel, purified your souls for an unhypocritical love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. And that means you have to work at this. It's not natural to love one another. Because we are all so very different that we don't think alike and there's a lot of things about us. So this takes diligence. A love that's stretched out. Love one another from the heart fervently. For you have been born again. Jesus said you must be born again. Born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but a seed which is imperishable. That is through the living and abiding, capital W, Word of God, Christ himself. The Word of the Lord, verse 25, abides forever. And this is the Word which was preached to you. That Word preached, received, becomes seed, internalized. Notice in James chapter 1, in verse 21, instead of anger, which does not attain the righteousness of God, therefore putting aside all filthiness, moral pollution. Why? Because the seed is in us, but we got to make sure we don't allow the ground to be cluttered with thorns and thistles and all that which would quench the word. Putting aside all filthiness and all that remains, that is the overflow of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted. Receive the word implanted. So at the gospel, the word is implanted. But to receive it means it needs to come from the human spirit and become the dominant characteristic that governs the soul. It's already here. He's talking to Christians. So the word's been implanted. When the gospel goes in, the spirit is regenerated. But now that word that is implanted needs to be released and come into the soul. So receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. What salvation is that? The same salvation that Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, with the result of the testing of our faith, the outcome of your faith is the salvation of your souls. This is sanctification salvation. So there's the new birth salvation of the soul. That's a one-time event. There's the progressive salvation of the soul, which is sanctification. The spirit is saved at new birth. The soul is being saved through sanctification. And then final salvation is when the body is redeemed and glorified. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9. He's dealing with the Gnostic heresy. People are saying that they are Christians, but they never bear fruit. Well then, according to John says, if there's no fruit in your life and you're claiming to be a Christian, you're a liar. There's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean a Christian can't apostatize and even die of the sin unto death. But he's looking at the practical difference between the many antichrists that are present teaching lawlessness and leading people into a false belief system. He's challenging that. So he says, no one, I could just add, truly begotten of God habitually practices sin. That's the tense. Why? Because Hebrews 12 says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, he scourges every son he receives. And if you're without discipline, you're illegitimate. If you're not disciplined, then you're not truly born again. That's why he's saying this, the one who is truly begotten of God habitually practices sin. Why? Because if he doesn't repent, he'll be dead. He'll die the sin of death. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 30. We see that was happening at Corinth. Why? Why does he not habitually practice sin? Because his, God's seed, abides in him. That's the word sperma, seed. 
So think about this. We're born again. There's a seed that enters into our spirit. We're regenerated. That DNA blueprint of all that we will be in the ages to come in our glorified state is inherent. Everything that we will be in our new creation identity comes in right at new birth. Whatever we will be a trillion years from now is already inherent in new birth. The divine seed is there. The spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ enters us at new birth. Now, that's tremendous, isn't it? We have the DNA of God. This sperma, this DNA and sperm. Well, this is divine sperma. His seed abides in him, and he cannot, present tense, habitually practice sin. Why? Because he is begotten of God. That new birth identity does not sin. Now, when we sin, we step out of that new birth identity. We're in the flesh, and we need to get back. But the new birth identity is perfect. It cannot sin. So if we sin, we step out of what we are as begotten of God, and we're now functioning, as we know in other passages, walking in the flesh, or living under the jurisdiction of the old humanity, which were to put off the old man. This sperma, by the way, in the Hebrew Bible, zereh, Sadiresh Ayan, it's the Hebrew word for seed. Genesis 3.15, there's the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The seed of the woman is Christ, Galatians 3.16. The seed of the serpent is Antichrist. God has DNA, Satan has DNA. Satan has a body, but is spiritual. Angels have bodies, but we don't see them. And they can, of course, assume even human form when they manifest. We know that through our scriptures. So there's the seed of the woman, Christ, seed of the serpent. There is a clash between two kingdoms, two species. The new creation species, Christian, are in conflict with that which represents Satan and his seed. That seed is the Antichrist. All hybrids are the seed of the serpent. Second Peter chapter 1, just by way of relating what we're looking at in terms of seed, the DNA of God, In 2 Peter chapter 1, grace and peace be multiplied to you. It's opted mood. It's a desire. It's a wish. It requires a volitional response. Let it be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the epinosis knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and intrinsic eminence. For by these, the expression of that glory in terms of our character, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, in order that by them you may become a joint koinonia, a partaker of the divine nature. Now, who possesses the divine nature? We don't possess it at birth. Jesus Christ is the only man that possesses a divine nature. He had a divine nature from the moment of his conception. And at conception, the sin code did not enter him to a human father. So the ovum was free of sin, like in every woman's ovum is free of sin. But when the conception occurs, the sin code from Adam comes in and spiritual death occurs. But since Jesus didn't have a human father, that ovum was supernaturally fertilized by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, he possessed a divine nature as man. And now that divine nature is fully glorified. So at new birth, we become a partaker of that divine nature. Notice what it says. It's God's purpose that we might become fellowshippers of the divine nature. We have it at new birth. But to fellowship, to allow that divine nature to grow and expand. How? By having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. That's how it grows. The participle is circumstantial and tells us the conditions on which we become, that's the main verb, partakers of the divine nature. The participle gives us, well, here's the conditions. This qualifies the verb becoming a partaker of divine nature by having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. It assumes that that's what you're doing. And then it goes on and gives examples of the positive way in which we become partakers of the divine nature in verses 5 through 9 those qualities, those attributes. That's the beginning. So new birth is the deposit. That is the entrance into our human spirit of that divine life, that divine seed. Now we are custodians. We are stewards of that life. We are called to cooperate with God so that that divine life can progressively grow and expand and enlarge and take that formation in us. We call that experiential sanctification. 
were sanctified at new birth, were set apart in Christ, but experientially the growth in consecration and holiness, that is sanctification, is progressive. So sanctification is the progressive development of the divine seed or that divine life implanted at new birth. It's the progressive development of the divine seed life nature that comes in at new birth. Notice Jesus, who in his sinless humanity, which was sinless but needed to grow, it needed to be perfected, not from a state of sin, but in terms of development. Remember, Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. He was perfected through sufferings in Hebrews. We see that in 2.10 and 5.9. He was perfected through sufferings. Hebrews 7.28, he's perfected forever. He went from an infant to a perfected man, and therefore, having met the criteria that God has for all of the human race, potentially, he is the prototype of the new humanity, of which Kurzweil and others are seeking to bring about through science, the convergence of technology, artificial intelligence, biology, and all the different convergence of science to create a new man. They're well in advance of doing that now. Notice John 17. Jesus prays this to the Father. He says in verse 14, I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I do not ask you, Father, to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, the old man is of the world. So he's speaking to them in terms of their true identity in view of that which would represent their new birth being begotten of God, as we saw in John. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, thy word is truth. Set them apart as holy, even as thy word is truth. As thou didst send me in the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves may be sanctified in the truth. So that's the progressive element of sanctification. There's growth in truth. We need objective facts. And then as those facts become experiential, then we begin to enter more experientially into what it means for Christ to be our life. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, this is addressing the Corinthians, who, because of their complicity in different relationships, they were not pursuing sanctification. And Paul is, of course, addressing that you, if you're complicit with idolatry, then you're going to be infected. Just like 1 Corinthians 5, 11 will come in, and that will retard the development and expansion and growth of that divine seed. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the whole illustration is the children of Israel dying in the wilderness in 1 Corinthians 10. They died in the wilderness. Why? Because of idolatry. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. So the whole wilderness generation is an example to the Corinthians. Therefore, my beloved, talking to Christians, flee, escape, ekfugo, escape by flight, idolatry. And so he talks about things sacrificed to idols. And they're not anything in of themselves. If he causes another brother to stumble, you should avoid it. But the thing itself is not something superstitious about it. If you go to the market and that animal is sacrificed to an idol and I eat it, what is that to you? I mean, why would you judge me? And Paul makes an issue of that in 1 Corinthians 9. But if it caused another brother to stumble, I will not eat it for the sake of their conscience. But there's nothing superstitious about meat that was slaughtered in a temple. He says, what do I mean? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that the idol is anything? Verse 20, but I say that the things which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. The Hebrew Bible would be the lesser Elohim. And not to God. And I do not want you to become fellowshippers with demons, but a fellowship of the divine nature. We just saw that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, we've been called into fellowship with God's Son, Jesus Christ, to become a partaker of that divine nature. So, Corinthians, I don't want you to become shares in demons. That is, by going to these idol temples. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake, become a share of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or why do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We're not stronger than he, are we? So it's possible to partake of demons. That means what they represent in their nature and character. But the first word, shares, is koinonos. That means a kind of a bond that represents that which is completely contrary to the divine life and what you are as a new creation. Going to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. He says, Do not be bound together, unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? By the way, Antichrist is the son of lawlessness. Jesus Christ is the righteous one. So what partnership is righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony, symphony, has Christ with Belial? Belial was used in the intertestament period by the Jewish apocryphal literature as a title for Satan. Okay? What harmony has Christ with Belial and or Satan? What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Notice the extreme contrast. For we are a temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them. Now, of course, Paul is citing from Leviticus 26. He says, I will dwell in them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And, of course, in that particular passage, Leviticus 26... Leviticus 26 is contrasting God's old covenant. You're in covenant relationship with me. If you do this, you'll be blessed. If not, you're going to be cursed. So he's talking to God's covenant people. Paul extrapolates this covenant promise to the children of Israel and now applies it to the church. The Old Testament is now interpreted in the New, and the New is giving further interpretation of the Old. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. That's consecration. That means you're committed to sanctification. And do not touch what is unclean. Now, we can touch the unclean, we'll see in a moment, physically or even in our spirit. Our spirits can touch that which is unclean. We'll notice that in a moment. Do not touch what is unclean. We have to watch what we see and are involved with. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And who is he talking to? Christians. Chapter 7, verse 1. Beloved, and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. If you're not, you're alienated. You don't know me as father. You're walking a carnal life. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. That would be Ponto Crotor, the Old Testament. El Shaddai, the one who is all-powerful and who is also seen as judge as well. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. This is contact with idolatry and spirit. And that's what I'm narrowing down on, as I just shared with you earlier. When I'm working with people who have an SRA history, they have a certain time frame in which they're going to come clean. And there are certain things that I'm going to be very, very specific on so that there is no defilement of my spirit that would affect you and my wife. I am not going to be involved with people over an extended period of time. They have so much time to come clean. I don't care what their problem is, and I don't care what the programming is, because at some point it's not programming. And God has given me protocol how to get to core really fast, and where the choices are made between 12 and the present. And so address that, And I'm not going to go into that now because that's not what this is about. But the fear of the Lord is going to be upon people that work with me. If they want to work with me, then there will be certain parameters right up front. And if the heart is truly ruling, they're going to come out a lot faster. Because if you're involved with idolatry, God is standing off at a difference. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. My ear is not so dull that I cannot hear, or my arm so short I cannot save. It's your iniquity that makes a separation between you and your God so that I am not able to hear, or you're not experiencing deliverance. God abandons his covenant people. Read Hosea. He let them alone. They want to serve idols? Let them alone. God departs. Turns his face away. Cry out all you want. I'm not going to listen. Read the prophets. Read Proverbs 1. So what does that do to us? You say, well, isn't God loving and merciful? Yeah, that's why we're all still breathing and alive. You know, we don't need to question that. The issue is, do we have the fear of the Lord? So therefore, having these promises, knowing God as Father, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, that's pursue sanctification, consecration, from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Present tense. Those who are characterized as perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Holiness is related to the word sanctification. They're cognates. They relate. All right? First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you, here it is, to increase to abound, to overflow in love for one another 
and for all men, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. He was expected to be alive and survive at this time in his history at the rapture. He was expecting that. So finally then, in the context of getting prepared for the Lord's coming, we need to be sanctified. By the way, the last verse of Hebrews chapter 9, Jesus is coming to bring final salvation only to those who eagerly await him. The Laodiceans are not eagerly awaiting him. So what's going to happen? He'll vomit them out of his mouth. It's not a loss of salvation. It's a loss of inheritance. What do we see here? Brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to order and conduct your life and please God, just as you actually do order your life, that you may excel still more. You know what commandment we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. You notice it doesn't say a recommendation or a suggestion. By the way, it's my opinion that you do this. You don't find any apostles giving any opinions. It's thus saith the Lord. A commandment is thus saith the Lord. It's a commandment. Entele is used in the secular language as a royal or imperial edict of a king. So this is an imperial edict. You know what imperial edict we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus For this is the will of God. You never have to ask, what's God's will? When His will is revealed in the Word. When it comes to specific things in your life, yeah, we need to know His will in some areas that the Word doesn't address. But when it comes to His revealed will, it's very clear. This is the will of God. Your sanctification, your growth in holiness, your growth in being aware of what it means set apart to the Lord. Crucified to the world, and the world crucified you. Galatians chapter 6. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, you abstain from sexual immorality, etc. Each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. For a husband, that would be the wife. If it's an individual, you're not married, it's your own body. It's a bifurcated application there, okay? So that's tremendous. First Thessalonians 5.23, I read that all the time. So in view of all that which is being ready and being prepared for the coming of the Lord, The epistle is talked so much about getting ready, being the state and condition of being prepared for the Lord's coming. And that's why we're looking at this, because we live in the generation that the Lord is going to return. We don't know the day of the hour, but we absolutely can know we live in the generation. How do we know that? Matthew 16. You can look at the sky and discern it's going to rain. You can discern by the sky what the weather's going to be. So what's wrong with you? Why can't you discern the signs of the time? Why don't you know where you are in history? You should be able to know where you are. First Chronicles twelve thirty two. The sons of Issachar were those who were knowers of the time. And they were able to tell Israel what to do. Is everybody knowers of the time? No. But if you're a son of Issachar, they were knowers of the time. What does it mean to be a person who is a knower of the time? We don't know the day of the hour, but we know we live in the generation. Why? Because Israel is the signpost prophetically. In this passage, now may the God of peace, the one who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and established peace, having removed the enmity between God and fallen mankind through the person and work of the death of Jesus Christ, and therefore bringing about a state of peace and tranquility through reconciliation, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And again, the optative mood expresses through the Apostle Paul, it's the Holy Spirit's desire But because it's the optative mood, it means you have a choice. We're workers together with him, 2 Corinthians 6.1. Notice, may, may he, optative, it's a desire, God desires this. We need to cooperate, sanctify you, holotales, that is, from the point of new birth, running all the way through to the end and consummation of your life, entirely. That is, may your spirit, soul, and body, three different domains, be preserved complete. at singular. Spirit complete. Soul complete. Body complete. So all three, although separate domains, are seen as a unified whole as the object of sanctification. One is entirely, second complete, holokleros, is found in James 1.4, Mature, complete, lacking in nothing. That's what suffering is designed to do. So this holokleros means soundness of character. 
that which represents who we are in our new birth identity actually becomes completely dominant and that which represents our character by the rapture. In other words, we've attained a sanctification that in God's purpose is an out-resurrection. It's an out-resurrection. Right here, I think God is kind of setting us up for a lot of ways. We've had a lot of physical challenges. As we're doing our part in sanctification, spirit, soul, and body, we had a whole week where we were looking at ways in which we could better cooperate with God so our bodies could be sanctified and so that those things that represent the working of death in us, we could come into alignment and God will always do his part. But through looking at some of these principles of biblical health and those kind of things, we cooperate with him so that God can bless us, so that it's a spirit, soul, and body unified holocleros, sound, like the Old Testament sacrifices. In order to be accepted by God, the priest would have to look it over, make sure there's no blemish. They're completely blemish-free, and this priest would say, to tell us die. Complete, ready for sacrifice. That's Jesus on the cross. He says it's finished. That's the seal of God. Here, this holokleros is the Greek word used for tom or tamim. That is a spotless sacrifice. So here, the character, but it includes a spirit-soul-body relation. Is in the singular here, we could put hyphens instead of and. We're one person. Who are we? We are, as persons, spirit, soul, and body. It's not like we have a spirit, and we have a soul, and we have a body. We're tripartite, but we're holistically viewed as one person. And as a person, we're spirit, soul, and body. That's to be a unified, sanctified, complete, without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that tells me? One of the things it tells me, those that are raptured are not going to be sick. Otherwise, what are you going to do with this? You can't be sick. So something's going to happen that in the day of visitation, it's going to bring forth ex anastasis, Philippians chapter 311, So that that which represents those that have been pursuing sanctification, spirit, soul, and body, that exonostasis is going to bring into manifestation that which represents a holokleros, a tamim person. Their body is going to be in a state that when it's glorified, there is a sanctified body. We mentioned that on Sunday. Now, that may stretch some of your concepts of where things are, but this is here. I'm not adding to the word. I'm taking this right from here. Without blame at the coming of Jesus Christ. Without spirit blame, soul blame, body blame. It's right here. We have to deal with it. Are there any areas of sanctification we need to think about? In our spirit? How are we feeding our spirit? Our soul life? You know, about our soul, our mind, emotion, will? And then our bodies. Alright? That's what we're to do. Now, do we need help? Well, here's God's commitment to this sanctification. Faithful as He is calling you to this three-dimensional fullness of sanctification, faithful as He was calling you, and He will also bring it to pass. He's going to do it. He's going to have a company ready and without blame at the coming of Jesus Christ. He's going to do it. And we looked at that on Sunday, the morning star, and what all this means. So we're just looking at some of the scriptural backbone or foundation for what we considered on Sunday. Hebrews chapter 12. God's goal is through Jesus Christ. He's bringing many sons to glory. Hebrews 2. He's bringing many sons to glory. Hebrews 2.10. If he's bringing many sons to glory through our high priest and through who he is as the greater Joshua, he's the greater sacrifice. Everything in Hebrews is there's something better about the new covenant, exceedingly better, and the person of Jesus Christ. In the passage where the Father is disciplining these sons he's bringing to glory, notice what he says, beginning in verse 11, the Father's discipline, so that why? That we may share in his holiness. Verse 10, our human fathers discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them, but our Father disciplines us for our intrinsic good, that we may, here it is, share, become a partaker of the divine nature. What is that? Holiness holiness so if we're going to grow in love it means we grow in holy love if we're going to become more in alignment with him as the truth it's all holy it's unique it's set apart it's god's domain all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful yet those who have been trained or exercised by it afterwards yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness holiness 10 is juxtaposed with righteousness verse 11 And what's righteousness? 
it's conformity to the revealed will of God in thought, word, and deed. That's Abbott and Smith's definition of dikaiosune in the Greek lexicon. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak in your service to God and the knees that are feeble because you're in a race, chapter 12, verse 1. Don't get knocked out of the race. Make straight paths for your feet. You have a clear objective. Verse 2, you're to be fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. We're to consider him again and again who endured such hostility. Verse 3, we're to make straight paths for our feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint and therefore you're knocked out of the race. Chapter 12, verse 1. You're knocked out of the race. You're disqualified. Last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says, I buffet my own body, lest having preached to others, I might become disqualified. Okay? There's a disqualification in the race. That's his exhortation to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, 13 there. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. As members, we need healing from that which would represent past idolatry in this passage because the root of bitterness, verse 15, is associated with idolatry in Deuteronomy 29.18. To whatever degree that Jesus Christ is not first place and we have something that's substituting him as first place, it's called idolatry. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. My little children flee from idolatry. What is that? Anything that interfere with our fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 4. So 1 John 5, 21, we're to flee from idolatry. Pursue, verse 14, peace with all men. And the sanctification, pursue it, the sanctification, without which no one will see the Lord. Now what are you going to do with that? Does that mean if you're born again, if you don't pursue sanctification, you're not going to see the Lord? It's ridiculous. It cannot mean that. Because you need to compare Scripture to Scripture. We know in 1 John 3, if we're born again, we're going to see Him as He is in varying degrees and measures. So what is this seeing the Lord here? I believe this is eschatological. The warning in Hebrews, the writer of the Hebrews is expecting the Lord to return in His own generation. He makes that very clear in chapter 10, verse 37 and 38. He makes it very clear. He's speaking to those. You need to get ready for the Lord to return and be among those who are waiting for final salvation, Hebrews 9.28, that you're going to experience final salvation. So if you're going to experience final salvation, Hebrews 9.27.28, that is, you're going to see the Lord. You're going to be alive and survive under the coming of the Lord. Then you need to pursue sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. You're not going to be alive. To the book of Hebrews, you'll be dead. That's what he's saying. You're not going to make it. It has to do with inheritance. It has nothing to do with eternal salvation. That's settled. When you're born again, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians chapter 1. That seal cannot be broken. God cannot lie. It's like it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, if we endure with him as we persevere with him, we shall soon bazalu, we shall reign as kings with him. But if we don't endure, we shall not reign with him. And if we deny him, that is the reign, he will deny us. You see? But if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he can deny himself. We're a part of himself. When we're born again, we become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He can't deny us, but he can refuse the reign. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 and following. That's it, pursuing the Lord. So pursuing sanctification. We want to be among those that are alive and survive that meet the Lord at the end. Seeing the Lord. Okay, So it can't refer to the loss of salvation. This has to do with eschatological salvation. How do we know that? Again, last verse of Hebrews 9. So let the Bible interpret itself. You don't have to wonder what it is. You don't have to look at the commentary. What was the commentary going to say about this? I just gave you the commentary. It's the book of Hebrews itself. Okay, Context determines interpretation. It's called hermeneutics. How do you interpret the Bible? When I took hermeneutics in seminary, I loved it. It was Protestant hermeneutics. I forgot the guy's name, but I still have it at home. But it was phenomenal to say, when you go to the Word of God, you have these things that seem to be conflicting. You compare Scripture with Scripture, and therefore the continuity of the divine revelation begins to fit together as you compare Scripture with Scripture. John chapter 3, verse 30. We know John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of the Messiah. He was the attendant to the bridegroom. He was like a friend to the bridegroom, Jesus. So, as the prophet, 
as he was proclaiming and introducing the bridegroom to Israel, they rejected it. So that bride is a hidden bride. It didn't come into existence until Pentecost. But John says, these people are leaving me as the forerunner Messiah and they're following Messiah. Don't be concerned about that. I must decrease, but he must increase. In chapter 5, John was a burning, being consumed, and therefore a shining lamp. To the degree that he was consumed, John 5, he became a shining lamp. So as he was decreasing, Jesus would grow. I must decrease in order that he might increase. Alzano, the Greek means to grow. In terms of our understanding of the divine seed, the divine life that comes into us at new birth, that growing comes as Second Corinthians chapter 4, as the outer man is corrupting, is, is dying. The outer man is not only the physical body, but the soul life as it relates to what we are in Adam, as that's disintegrating. We are live or being delivered over to Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. As we are decreasing in our natural strength, then the Holy Spirit takes that opportunity and he grows and he increases. See? That's sanctification. How do we understand this process? As believers, this metamorphosis, this change of essential form, the outer man is dying. It's a schema. The outer man is a schema. It's an outer form, but it doesn't represent who we are internally. Our new nature And our new humanity requires a spiritual body. That's in resurrection. Our bodies are not redeemed. In order for who we are and our true spiritual new birth identity requires a spiritual body. We have a solical body now designed to express the soul. It's not anything wrong with it, but there's sin in it. It is dying. This metamorphosis begins a new birth and progressively develops through a process of formation. Formation. That passage is found in Galatians 4. First of all, the principle of that divine seed, when it enters our life, if the progress is normal, then in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, Paul prays that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you might know the full knowledge of him, the eyes of your heart being flooded with light. Well, that's what Paul describes what happened at new birth. The revelation he received of Christ in Galatians 1, As he was advancing in Judaism, Galatians 1.14, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was advancing in Jerusalem. But on that road, Galatians 1.15, when God, who had set me apart, even from a mother's womb, he called me through his grace, God was pleased to apocalypto, to unveil his son in me. That's when it began. But the beginning involves a process That unveiling would continue to grow. God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of him. Ephesians 1 verse 17. It pleased God to unveil his son in me. The book of Revelation is apocalypsis. is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Well, that will not happen to Israel and nations until Christ has been fully unveiled in the church to that state and degree that there will be a resultant epiphany, an exonastasis, which we will have to look at that again later. It was God's purpose to unveil his son in me. Why? That I might proclaim him. Not just a message, but an actual revelation of a person. And what did that look like? When Paul was proclaiming him as a result of Christ being revealed in him? Well, verse 23, you know, all they heard of him is once persecuted the church, but he once persecuted us, is now preaching the faith which he tried to destroy. Verse 24, and they were glorifying God. You know what the Greek says? in me. There's no because. It's in. Why? Because Jesus being revealed in him is the God who they were glorifying. And so Galatians being bewitched by the Judaizers, Galatians 3, 1 and following. Verse 3 of chapter 3, I mean, begun in the spirit, you're now being perfected in the flesh by trying to come back under Jewish ordinances and coming back under the Mosaic law. He says, you're running well, who broke in on your stride, Galatians 5, 7. You began, and now you're trying to be perfected in the flesh by submitting to the Judaizers. Paul is in travail of this. He says in Galatians 4.16, Have I become your enemy by literally being the truth? It's the same participial form that we find in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Being the truth in love were to grow up in him with reference to all things. Same thing here. Did I become your enemy by being the truth? 
That includes speaking the truth, but my whole person is demonstrating the truth to you. I'm an authentic person. What you see is what you get. I don't live a double life. They eagerly seek you, that is the Judaizers, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I'm present with you. My children, with whom I am again in labor. I was once in labor, so you would come to birth. You've already come to birth, but now it's like, what happened to you? You're supposed to come out, and that which is the divine seed is supposed to be visible now, bearing fruit, and it's like you're not even born. You're still stuck in the womb. I'm in travail again until Christ be fully formed in you. What an indictment. What an utter indictment. But what's the word? It's the root word morphe. Remember Jesus was metamorphosed on the Mount of Transfiguration? We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Remember that in Romans 12.2? Remember, beholding and reflecting as the mirror of the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed from one degree of glory even to the next, even by the Lord who is present, active in the Holy Spirit. Remember that, 2 Corinthians 3.18? That's metamorphosis. So the root is morpho, the morphe. This is the verb, morpho. I'm in travail again until that divine life you have allowed to take its essential form and manifest that essential form so that in your life, free from the law, a life governed by the Spirit, when people see you, it will correspond to your new birth identity, who you are as begotten of God, because the morphe of that divine life and that divine seed is being expressed in your outward life. Because morphe is something that you see, but it directly represents and corresponds to essentially who you are. So that's the morphe. You see? So that's the development of the divine seed and the manifestation. Let's look at a couple more then we can bring this particular session to a close. Philippians 3. We know Paul's aspiration. You know, he says that in verse 7, whatever gains he's counted as one combined loss for the sake of Christ. And his whole pursuit is that he may gain Christ. Philippians 3. He has Christ, but he wants Christ to be fully formed, and therefore to gain Christ. And to gain Christ simply means that he would be perfected in such a way, verse 12, in order that he may lay hold of, that is, apprehend that for which he's been apprehended and lay hold of Christ. So he has Christ, but he wants to know Christ in fullness. He says that I might know him, verse 10, and even the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. There it is, fellowship of his sufferings. That is something that we never really get fully used to. Colossians one twenty four is another commentary on that. The fellowship of his sufferings. How? How do we know Christ and the power of his resurrection? That brings us into capacity to enter into more fellowship with his sufferings. He's suffering in his body now. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3-7. through 7. Colossians one twenty four. He's suffering. How is this to take place? The participle tells us how. By being conformed to his death. What's that conformed? That's sum morphizomai. The root is morphe, to take on the same essential form as his death. But sum means a sharing, a fellowship in the morphe of Christ's death. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 and following. That we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal body. What's going on in this is the dying of Jesus. It's necrosis. There's a necrosis. The Holy Spirit is applying the cross and there's a necrosis. There's a dying to everything in us that still has its experiential roots in Adam and God is weaning us and circumcising us and making a place for Christ to increase and grow. Conformed. There it is. This is a present passive participle. It means it's process going on. He wants to be conformed to Christ's death. To take on the same essential form. Why? So that out from that conformity, verse 11 will be filled, that I might attain. This is not a physical resurrection. You can't attain that. That happens de facto when the trumpet sounds. 1 Corinthians 15, where the dead are raised in Christ. It's not an attainment. But this is an out-resurrection. It's something that takes place in time through the process of sanctification and being conformed to his death in order that I may attain, same verb used in Ephesians 4.13, of attaining the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here it's personal. Arrive at the goal 
of the out-resurrection from among the dead. He's looking for that which Peter talks about was corporately is going to be the day of visitation. He's going to produce this. The morning star rising in the heart. That's an exonostasis event. Peter was there. We made known to you the power and coming of our Lord. That's exonostasis. Romans 8, 28. And we should be able to bring some closure to this section. We can pick up next time and follow through with this. In Romans 8, we know the verse very well. I'm going to give it to you as is in the Greek because the emphasis is a little bit different. The Greek goes like this. To those who are characterized as loving God. That's how the sentence begins in the original. To those who are characterized as loving God. He, God, causes all things to soon ago, to work together for the good. And God defines that good in verse 29. To those who are the called ones according to his purpose. In verse 29, to those whom he foreknew, that is before the creation of the universe, these same ones he also called to be transformed to the image of his son. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined, he marked out in eternity past, to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among men and brethren. The word conformed there is sumorphos. Philippians 3.10, that's the participle, sumorphizo. This is the noun, sumorphos. That's stative. Stative means it's God's goal that we reach a state and condition of sumorphe, same essential form of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? The same essential form, this divine life, this divine nature, is to be perfected through sanctification. When that reaches a state of sanctification, the only thing left is the redemption of our body, and then we receive a spiritual body to manifest this conformity. Because right now we have a solical body, a sukikos body. This is all Paul's thinking. None of this originates with me. I'm just extrapolating to you the language that Paul is using. This is how they understood this. That we, now this is really amazing when you think about this. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. The noun there, sumorphos, is in the plural. Can you imagine what kind of wisdom it would take? Let's say from Pentecost to the rapture, we have 10 billion people that are saved throughout history. Okay? That means in that 10 billion individuals, there is a plurality of conformity that God is responsible to integrate and to create a singular organism that will manifest the glory of God in Christ forever. That takes infinite wisdom. It's the plural. Each one of us are in there. But what's the goal? A singularity. Image, singular. Sumorphos, plural. Image, icon, singular. There'll be one unified manifestation. That which is the image of the invisible God will be seen in this morphe, glorified morphe. Sumorphos. That is Romans 8.29. On Sunday we looked at Romans 12.2. Stop being conformed. Suskematizo. Adapting our outward man. But go on allowing yourself to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We touched that on Sunday. And I want to read from Weiss' translation and we'll conclude with that verse. Dr. Kenneth Weiss was a professor of Greek New Testament for many years at Moody Bible Institute. And he has a lot of very excellent commentaries on the New Testament, the Weiss commentaries. This is the Weiss translation. This is his translation of the New Testament as one who is a professor of Greek. And what he did is he, in translating it, he used as many English words as necessary to bring out the richness of the Greek language. I'm going to read Romans 12, 1 and 2 and the Kenneth Weiss edition, his expanded translation. I therefore exhort you, or beg you, he says, please, brethren, through the instrumentality of the aforementioned mercies of God, that you, by a once and for all presentation, to place your bodies at the disposal of God, a sacrifice, a living one, a holy one, well-pleasing, your rational, sacred service, rational in that this service is performed by the exercise of the mind, and we would include the will. Stop assuming, present tense, Stop assuming an outward expression in your behavior and conduct. Stop assuming the outward expression that does not come from within you and is not representative of what you are in your inner being, that is, as a new creation, but is patterned after this age. But to the contrary, change, 
Allow yourselves to be transformed. That's my translation. Change your outward expression and allow yourself to be transformed to one that comes from within and is representative of your inner being, your true morphe, not outward form, your true being, your divine nature. How? By the renewing of your mind, resulting in your putting to the test what is the will of God, the good and well-pleasing and complete will. And having found that it meets specifications, place your approval upon it. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to consider that which is the revelation of who you are, your will, your purpose in our lives. I ask you to sanctify and set apart that which we're considering so that it will bear fruit right on into eternity. Because what we're considering, you know, Lord, is all we're going to take into eternity with us. Everything else is going to be gone. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.